The Earmax Center is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts six presentations per semester. For the fall 2009 semester, the presenters belong to the faculties of Applied Sciences, Arts and Social Sciences, Business Administration, and the Faculty of Education. Today's speaker is Dr. S. Chink Sehnop, Canada Research Chair in Computational Genomics, School of Computing Science. Um, Cenk was born in um, Ankara, Turkey, um, where he um, studied electrical engineering at uh, Bilkent University for his uh, uh, BSc. And uh, then he moved uh, quite a bit uh, westwards uh, to get his uh, PhD from uh, his PhD in computer science from um, the University of uh, Maryland, Maryland uh, College Park. Um, and now I have to use my, uh, my notes here. Um, He, after his, uh, after finishing his PhD, he also um, he was a staff member at uh, Bell Labs, Murray Hill, and uh, later then a faculty at uh, Warwick University um, in England. Um, during that time, he was also affiliated with the Center for Bioinformatics uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and frequently visited DIMAX, um, Bell Labs, and AT&T. So after some time in 1999, he decided that's too much travel, travel too much of a hassle, and he joined um, Case Western Reserve Univers University as an assistant professor in computing science, computer science, um, where he also became a founding member of the Center for Computational Genomics and an adjunct faculty in the Department of uh, Genetics, um, Case School of Medicine. See, he may tell us later if he is still practicing medicine. Uh, <laughs> then in 19, uh, sorry, in 2003, he finally joined um, the School of uh, Computing Science at Simon Fraser University, where he now is um, Professor and Canada Research Chair in Computational Genomics and the Director of um, the Lab for Computational Biology. He has received over his um, quite impressive career a number of um, uh, outstanding uh, rewards and just to mention awards, uh, just to mention uh, one. It's uh, the Michael Smith uh, Foundation for Health Research, Research Award. And he currently is a member of the Michael Smith Foundation uh, for Health Research and Canada Institute for Health Research uh, Bioinformatics uh, Training Program. And he is an associate faculty um, at the Department of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry at Simon Fraser University. His research focuses on biomolecular sequence analysis, RNA structure, and uh, interaction prediction, topological properties of biomolecular networks, and more recently, QSAR analysis. I actually had to look that up once. <laughs> um, besides, um, I've heard uh, he is a very enthusiastic um, a road cyclist and um, mountain biker, especially downhill from the Burnaby Mountain Campus. <laughs> um, so his uh, presentation today, in his presentation today, he is uh, going to talk about combinatorial algorithms for structural variation detection in high throughput sequence genomes. Cheng, please, the floor is yours. You have your own. Yeah, I have my own. Um, so this is the holy grail of what we do. Personalized genomics. You may have heard about it. Um, and here's some information that you may have already known, or it may be new to you. But uh, the bottom line is we have new uh, sequencing technologies. 
you know that the Human Genome Project took uh, about 10 years and required more than $10 billion to uh, complete the sequencing of one individual. It wasn't actually one individual. It was a mixture of five individu in individuals. And yet, the next generation, or more precisely now, the third generation sequencing platforms, offer a huge cost reduction by factors of millions and uh, reduction in time uh, to get your individual human uh, genome sequence uh, for the following reason. Now that we know how human uh, genome sequences look like, we know there are significant differences between you and me. It's not just in the form of uh, SNPs, as people thought, single nucleotide differences, polymorphisms, but also uh, major rearrangements. <clears throat> and we know that they are the causes of many diseases. We have to figure out what these differences are. And perhaps when we have a full profile of uh, such events, such structural variation events, we'll be able to figure out cures for these diseases. So the, our genetic identity not only differ, uh, uh, determines our differences in terms of our physical uh, makeup, but also our susceptibility to disease. Eventually, we'd like to do genotype-phenotype associations. We'd like to know which particular variation is responsible for which disease. And I, we'd like to eventually optimize drug combinations for individuals, for your own genetic makeup. So the high the throughput sequencing is a reality. Uh, it's been around for the past two years or so. Um, now we can, uh, for, uh, we can sequence an individual uh, with good coverage from beginning to end for about $100,000. Uh, Soon it will be just a few thousand dollars. Uh, with increasing speed and accuracy, we should be able to figure out what are the differences between a particular individual genome sequence and others. Unfortunately, uh, the new sequencing technologies do not have the same accuracy as the capillary traditional sequencing technologies. So uh, there's some uh, trade-off with uh, cost and accuracy. And also another problem comes from the small uh, read sizes. Our uh, genome sequence compo is composed of about 3 billion nucleotides, individual letters that make up your uh, genome sequence from the well-known four-letter alphabet. Each read we are talking about is in the order of 30 to a few hundred base pairs. So you'll require millions, tens of millions reads to cover your entire genome sequence. You need actually more than a single genome sequenced out, but rather many uh, copies of it. Um, especially the technology that has provided us the best uh, cost is the Illumina technology, which provides at this moment uh, in, the road, in the order of 50 base pair reads. Soon it will be a few hundred. So uh, putting the short reads together to figure out all the structural variations is a challenging task. Fortunately, there's another technology that improves the accuracy of our predictions, and that is the paired end sequencing technology. In the paired end sequencing, what you basically do is chop larger pieces off from your genome sequence, individually and randomly uh, chop one uh, uh, genome uh, copy to pieces of length in the order of a few hundred base pairs, and read from two ends, from the left end and from the left, uh, right end. You won't, you won't be able to read uh, the sequence out very accurately uh, all the way. But at least if I know the uh, length of the fragment that I read, I'll have two uh, reads between which I know a certain distance uh, is present. So if I have a good filter that would guarantee that the fragment size is at least delta min, 
and at most delta max, then I can deduce something out of this. <coughs> In fact, the distribution of the uh, fragment size follows a normal, uh, tight normal distribution. Um, the uh, particular technology that we use uh, uh, employs a filter that passes only fragments of size, about 150 base pairs to 250 base pairs. Yeah. When we see a distribution like that, is that all different fragments from all different places? Uh, is yes. That, like, it's not like different copies of the same. It's the whole spectrum of what you're going to exactly. do. Exactly. So what is structural variation? What kind of variations do we observe uh, among individual genomes? <coughs> uh, first, deletions. Large-scale deletions are prevalent. Insertions of sequences, typically in the form of duplications. The origin of the uh, inserted sequences is, again, typically the human genome sequence itself. So large-scale copy events, as well as insertions from the bacteria or viruses that you host. Inversion events, reversal of a sequence, transposition and translocation, moving a particular sequence from a location in, the, uh, in chromosome A to another location in chromosome A or chromosome B. And copy number variations. There are certain um, mobile elements or uh, uh, other duplications that uh, are seen sometimes thousands of times in the genome sequence. And these events make up uh, a significant portion of your genome sequence. More than half of your genome sequence can be traced to uh, the duplication events. And they make an important contribution to the diversity of human uh, individuals. Um, so, um, given the paired end reads that we obtain, the fra remember the fragments, the small pieces of your genome se sequence, which are read from left end and the right end, that provides a paired end uh, read. You can try to map them. You can try to figure out where they come from on the reference genome. The reference genome is the combination, the amalgamation of uh, multiple individuals uh, to get a blueprint of the human genome sequence. This was uh, the end result of the Human Genome Project. So you have one reference genome sequence which is assembled, which is uh, also provided to you in full, and you'd like to know the differences between the individual genome sequence that you just obtained, uh, only the fragments, in fact, the paired and reads are given to you, and you'd like to sort of map them, you'd like to find where they come from in the reference genome to figure out the differences between the individual genome sequence and the reference. And um, if a paired and read maps to a unique place, a unique location, and yet you see the distance between the two reads have opened up, have increased or decreased beyond the range suggests, then you suspect that there's something going on. There's a structural variation event in the form of an insertion or a deletion going on. Um, a change of orientation imposes an inversion. <coughs> so here's a picture. Um, do I have a pointer? I guess not. Uh, it's, it's not very important. You can see in uh, figure A, you can see that the reference genome, uh, uh, the difference between the reference genome and the uh, donor genome, the individual genome that you sequenced, if the original uh, paired and read is in uh, the donor genome, and if it maps to the reference genome as indicated there, clearly there has been a deletion to the reference genome. So what you observe to be a larger sequence is now a shorter sequence in the donor genome, uh, which imposes a deletion event on us. Similarly, you can see what an insertion will look like. The tandem repeats, a repeat uh, sequence which occurs next to uh, uh, one another many, many times, thousands of times sometimes. 
or you can see what an inversion may be or a translocation may be uh, looking like uh, once the mappings are done. So if I had a unique mapping location per uh, paired and read, my job would be easy. I will immediately deduce what's going on. Unfortunately, uh, life is not so easy. Typically, a paired and read, due to the duplicative nature of the human genome, will map to about a thousand locations. <laughs> and I have to figure out which one of these thousand locations is the true uh, mapping location. For that, first we had to figure out all the thousand locations that a, a single paired and read would map, and the available uh, methods did not provide this information to us. We wanted to figure out every single location without, a, uh, without missing one. So we developed uh, the software called Mr. Fast, which is not too sophisticated from the algorithmic side, but uh, works quite fast. Uh, the first author of uh, the paper that described Mr. describes Mr. Fast just recently appeared in Nature Genetics. It's uh, John Alcan, an ex-PhD student of uh, my lab, and uh, Feridun, who is sitting right there, also contributed to the development of the algorithm considerably. And they applied uh, Mr. Fast to figure out copy number variation between individuals. A new version of Mr. Mrs. Mr. Fast is called Mrs. Fast, much faster, more accurate. Um, Mrs. Fast is also interesting because it uh, employs new algorithmic technology. It, it uses the notion of cache obliviousness to accommodate any hierarchy and any size uh, cache structure to be much faster than the competition. Um, and once the mapping locations, potential mapping locations of individual reads are obtained, we have to figure out the correct ones by jointly analyzing the mappings through a uh, software called Variation Hunter. <coughs> this also appeared uh, pretty recently uh, in Recomb and simultaneously in Genome Research. It's a special issue of Recomb. Um, in Variation Hunter, there are two options. Either you try to figure out the structural variations through the maximum parsimony approach or through the maximum likelihood estimation. And I'll tell uh, what each of these approaches provide. But for the users, the main difference is the first approach is very fast and perhaps a bit less accurate. The second approach is more accurate, but definitely much slower. So if you want a quick and dirty solution to see how the variation uh, map uh, looks like, you go with the first one. So I'll have to say a few things about the mathematical modeling of uh, paired and reads and their mappings. As we said, the paired and read will include the left uh, uh, portion and the right portion. Um, and basically, the whole genome shotgun sequence, G, is a set of paired and reads. You don't know where they come from. It's just given to you as a pair of sequences. And you have to find an alignment. Basically, take the paired and read, align the left side to somewhere in the reference genome, align the right side to somewhere in the reference genome, hope that the distance between them uh, agrees with the distribution that I mentioned. If it doesn't, if it does, you can forget about it. It doesn't suggest a structural variation. If it does vary from the distribution, then you become suspicious and you keep it. A structural variation for us, again, uh, is an event which has basically a location and length. And an alignment of a uh, uh, paired and read is basically an alignment of the left read and the right e read, as well as the order. You can figure out whether there's an insertion or deletion, depending on very simple uh, relations between uh, the length distribution, the alignment locations, and so on. So based on uh, the mappings, and you have to consider all the mappings of all reads, you have to come up with clusters. We call a cluster a valid cluster if the uh, 
paired end reads within a cluster all support the same structural variation. So our simple goal is to find maximum evidence for a particular paired end, uh, particular structural variation. If I have one paired end read suggesting a deletion, I become suspicious. If there are two, I became more suspicious. If there are a hundred of them, I become pretty sure. So I'm looking for evidence for supporting a structural variation. And um, for the insertions, the evidence is very uh, clear. If a bunch of uh, paired and read mappings support the same particular insertion length, if there's an overlap between the insertion length range, then they form a valid cluster. And I'm interested in the maximum size valid clusters. I, I try to make the clusters as big as possible. And there's a combinatorial way that guarantees that we find the, the maximal clusters. So um, I think that's pretty important. And once we find the maximal uh, uh, valid clusters by scanning from left to right and uh, analyzing all the uh, read alignments, um, we have to check out whether they uh, agree with one particular insertion length. And we have to make sure that there are no uh, duplications in the uh, work that we do. We have these clusters, each of which supporting a particular structural variation event. So now we have a combinatorial problem. I have a bunch of clusters supporting it uh, or suggesting a uh, structural variation event. And I have a bunch of paired and reads that map to more than one uh, locations. How do I know which of these structural variations are correct? And how do I know which of these alignments are correct? So I can solve these simultaneously, either through maximum parsimony or maximum likelihood estimation. The maximum parsimony approach is simple. What we try to find is uh, to uh, create all uh, maximum valid clusters for each type of structural variation and uh, figure out which of these have the highest support. So in general, this problem is NP-hard. However, we find uh, a very simple approximation algorithm based on the logarithmic approximation for the set cover method, for the set cover problem. So if we have sets that are uh, paired and read uh, mappings that support the same structural variation. So each cluster gives a set. And the universe that we'd like to cover is uh, the set of all paired ends. So each paired end uh, read should be mapped to one location. And we'd like to cover the whole space with the uh, minimum number of um, clusters. You can easily do uh, this by a greedy algorithm that provides a logarithmic approximation. The maximum likelihood estimation for structural variations are a bit more tricky. Um, we have to now assign independent probabilities to each structural variation and each paired and read alignment. The probability of each structural variation is a function of all the alignments and uh, to, to, uh, that, that support the particular uh, structural variation, the length information, and so on and so forth. It, it depends on uh, how well uh, these uh, clusters support the uh, structural variation event. And the probability of a particular read mapping depends on how likely do we have that structural variation. If there's a mapping, a discordant mapping of a paired and read to a particular location, it means that there must be a structural variation because everything that concordantly maps has been thrown out. Thus, I have to be very sure that the uh, structural variation event that the read supports is there. If the probability of the structural variation event is low, then I shouldn't be mapping my read to that particular location. So it's a function of the sequence similarity as well as the support the structural variation gets. So uh, this is also not done independently from the other structural variations the read uh, supports. As a result, 
we have a bunch of equations that link structural variations to read uh, mappings and read mappings to structural variations and we have to solve them simultaneously. And we do standard maximum likelihood estimation by starting with the null, null hypothesis on structural variations. We assume they're all equally likely and calculate the probabilities of the alignments and uh, go back to the probability of structural variations and so on and so forth until we converge. Uh, we can do it a number of times to get the probabilities of the events that I mentioned. And then you can pick up your favorite clustering mechanism. Now you have weights on uh, alignments and the weights on uh, structural variations. Uh, you can do a very greedy calculation, pick up uh, the structural variation events which are most likely, or pick up the mappings which are most likely, or something more sophisticated. So any questions so far? <laughs> yeah. The maximum likelihood probabilities are based on the probabilities of events, like the probability of a deletion versus an insertion, or it, more, it also uh, more, uh, uh, can like incorporate that full distribution of those lengths. Or so. hmm? The lengths are a part of it, so it's uh, we assume that each of these uh, pieces of information independently give evidence. So we have to multiply or add the log uh, likelihood of the following. Uh, what is the length of the structural variation? Is it uh, agreeing with what you think a deletion uh, should look like? What is the uh, support that you get from the uh, paired end reads? If I have five paired end reads, all mapping to the same location, and they agree, because these are not exact mapping locations, when I try to map a read to a particular location, I'm not looking for identity. There are some differences between them. These differences can be in the form of indels, insertions and deletions, which are very rare, or in the uh, form of mismatches, which are more common. We allow up to uh, two such differences. So the sequence similarity uh, is involved. And all the other structural variation uh, events, that has to be considered. So uh, the existence of one structural variation event may preclude the existence of another. They can uh, overlap, they can prohibit each other. So we have to, not always, but we have to, in the ideal world, uh, avoid that kind of scenarios. Yeah. Did you say that you assumed 100% support of an event? That if you found things that, so you will pick up heterozygous? Yes, yes. What I'm explaining now is the homozygous uh, version of it, but uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm not going to give any exp uh, experimental results on that. What I'm going to show uh, will be uh, having false positives due to what you just mentioned. So uh, I'm looking for uh, a minimum number of supports, so on and so forth. Um, so, the results that I'm going to show, I'm going to show very few results, uh, not to particularly bore you, but these are two uh, human individuals sequenced as a part of uh, the 1000 Genomes project that we provide algorithmic support for. This is a very ambitious project. For the first time, 1000 healthy individuals from uh, different backgrounds are sequenced through a consortium, and we participate in the structural variation detection end to see what are the typical variations between healthy individuals. So before moving into disease states, we have to know what are the common differences. And uh, the read lengths are pretty short. Uh, we use Mr. Fast for the mapping initially. And uh, as I said, 30% of the reads on average uh, map to about uh, 1,000 locations. The rest have unique mappings. Um, so, here are the two individuals. We uh, compare only our performance with respect to deletion detection and insertion detection. The FOSMID validated uh, insertions and deletions are those that have been validated in wet lab. We know their existence, but there are many more 
we know that there are many more which exist. These are individual uh, samples that have been verified. So uh, our two programs, Variation Hunter uh, Set Cover and Variation Hunter Probabilistic, provide different results. Um, so the predicted uh, deletions you can see are not too bad. Uh, inversion, we have a long way to go. And uh, compare this with alternatives, that map every single uh, uh, paired and read to a single location. The uh, tools that are available and are popular, such as uh, Mac, Bowtie, uh, BWA, aim to find the best mapping location of a particular read. Um, and if you uh, simply use that strategy, uh, f clearly fewer number of deletions are found, and infer inversions, they didn't do a study of uh, this sort. Uh, there are uh, two other groups, in fact, a few other groups, uh, that compete with us with respect to structural variation detection. And this is uh, the second table is for another in individual. Again, for the deletions out of 58 uh, validated deletions, we were able to find 34 of them. Uh, the alternatives are uh, not doing that well. Obviously, we predict more uh, deletions than the alternatives. As you can see, uh, this is our true positive rate with respect to some of our competitors. Um, and uh, you can see um, our, unfortunately, false negatives are uh, quite a bit higher. But many of these uh, uh, errors are due to the fact that, number one, uh, the genome has a diploid nature, it's not uh, haploid. Number two, uh, there are many events that are uh, reported as uh, deletions, and uh, there are better explanations for that. I don't, I'm not going to give you uh, the results that we obtained in the latest amalgamation of our software due to the fact that the results aren't stable yet, but we are uh, uh, much, much better than what we report at this point. So. Um, There's some recent follow-up work on what we have done. Uh, Mark Gerstein's group in uh, Yale showed that by using longer reads or uh, longer inserts, a higher true positive rate can be achieved. That comes as no surprise. Or um, in Boston College, uh, Gabor Marth and colleagues showed that uh, using depth of coverage information, which is the amount of uh, mappings to a particular location, in addition to uh, the paired and read data, can reduce the false positive rates. And using other probabilistic models, you can actually focus on the smaller variants uh, that we cannot catch. Um, and finally, the structural variation uh, detection method that we uh, provide doesn't exactly give you the breakpoints where exactly a, a structural variation starts and where it ends. We don't even try to give uh, uh, the probabilistic interpretation to the structural variations that we provide. But if you are careful about it, you may be able to uh, give a good range for the uh, start and end locations of the variation events. So there are a number of uh, papers we wrote uh, in this direction. Um, some of them directly uh, aiming to uh, uh, predict structural variation events. Some of them are supporting underlying technologies for uh, detection of structural variation. Um, but there are many other things that you can do with the next-gen uh, sequencing technology. For example, uh, our joint work with Peter Unrau's group aims to uh, do a comparative study of uh, the transcriptomes of uh, plant species the pine, and the rice. And uh, several algorithms that we developed have uh, provided the underlying uh, technology for our uh, later work. And earlier uh, work 
uh, to figure out the uh, centromeric DNA composition of uh, not only indiv uh, humans but uh, other primates uh, was the first uh, uh, paper in this direction. But I have to say, there are many other papers uh, and many other projects that I was involved in the past uh, 10 years that set the groundwork uh, for what we have been doing uh, recently, which is probably more applicable. So, uh, if we have time, I'd like to say a few words about first the underlying mathematical and algorithmic uh, background and uh, why it is important to do sometimes unguided research. It may have uh, consequences uh, beyond obvious. <coughs> so if you look at some of these uh, papers, the ones that are from early 2000s and uh, late 90s have all appeared in theory venues. <coughs> the reason is because I was a theoretician. And I cared about sequence algorithms, algorithms for comparing sets, vectors, in particular sequences. And uh, much of the work that I did in this subject considered applications of uh, this work to genome analysis at some future time, but really didn't care about the uh, specific uh, uh, nature of the uh, genome analysis problems. For me, I was just dealing with sequences from a particular alphabet. And uh, at that time, in 1998, uh, the first algorithms for comparing uh, sets and vectors with very powerful indexing techniques started to show up. <laughs> for example, in the same stock in 98, Piotr Indyk and uh, Ostrowski and Rabani, they came up with two independent papers for searching for vectors, bit vectors, among a collection of vectors. They were looking for the nearest neighbor, the most similar vector to a particular bit vector under the so-called Hamming distance. So they came up with the first approximation algorithms for this. The goal is to process uh, the given collection in time polynomial with the size of the data set so that the nearest neighbor up to a 1 plus epsilon approximation factor can be de uh, deduced in time proportional to uh, a given query size. So that uh, started the whole quest for setting up index structures for other uh, vectors, vector spaces. So in a vector space, Comparing two objects are very similar, uh, very easy. All you have to do is look at the i-th dimension in uh, vector 1, look at the i-th dimension in vector 2, do something, compare them, subtract them most commonly, add the differences up, and voila, you have a distance. In sequences, this is not very clear. In sequences, typically what you do is insert some blank symbols. What you're going to compare against what other is not clear, and you're trying to look for the best arrangement, uh, best mapping of objects from uh, the first vector, the first sequence, to objects from the second sequence. Most of the work in this direction was done without altering the orientation or the location of the objects to be uh, compared. So a sequence is, by definition, a bunch of objects whose order is provided to. So compare this with the uh, structure variation detection problem. As I said, the genome sequence is changing, not by s through local alterations, but also huge rearrangements. You cut, copy, paste, delete, uh, translocate, transpose, re uh, invert. So you have to come up with better uh, distance measures. So at that time, maybe I should uh, skip some of these. Uh, it talks about the history of all those distances. <laughs> it will come in a second. Uh, 
lights. At that time, we start to consider a very simple metric. So I'm not allowed to only uh, align uh, objects in the correct order, but I'm allowed to move things around. So Ulam metric is defined only on permutations. It was important for gene order under the assumption that each gene is unique. But if I'd like to compare one genome sequence against the other by just considering the gene order, then Ulam metric comes pretty handy. And uh, we first came up with a logarithmic approximation to this metric. Then, in 2000, uh, year 2000, we came up with the notion of a block edit distance. This is the minimum number of single character and uh, uh, block edits to convert one sequence to the other. What do, you, what do I mean by that? So it's the minimum number of insertion, deletion, and uh, substitutions of symbol, single symbols, as well as the Block moves, copying one substring from a location uh, to another one, deletion, and translocation uh, of a block. Each would have cost one. And we tried to come up with algorithms for this. It was important for communication problems, but I thought it would be quite cool to have it for genome analysis at some point. Mind you, in, uh, in year 2000, we were far from the completion of the uh, human genome project, so they said, we can't see an application for this in any time soon. So one thing that was interesting is that although the problem is MP hard, which is, it is one of the reasons why people get frustrated, it still can be approximated within almost logarithmic factor <coughs> in polynomial time. Not only that, you can index sequences under the block edit distance to search for nearest neighbors pretty fast. I'm hoping that at some point it will have real practical applications in genome analysis. It is pretty important for comparing documents, for example. The way uh, certain uh, text is edited and updated, uh, you know that these basic edit operations are applied. While you're writing a paper, you apply these edit operations. And if you'd like to compare uh, Sequences under such edit operations, if you'd like to find the most similar uh, sequence among a collection to a given query sequence, you can use an indexing technique that would give you fast results. Of course, some people are not interested in all the edit operations the block edit distance supports, but only moves, the translocations. Similar results exist for moves. And in fact, uh, we know that neither can be computed in polynomial time, but if you want to compute the latter, the second uh, problem, approximately, then there's a 1.5 factor approximation uh, figured out by Pevzer and Bafna, who are also uh, doing computational biology at this point. So, um, Maybe I shouldn't get into uh, more details because we are running out of time. Um, but what I'd like to say is uh, there's a bulk of literature that is focusing on uh, uh, sequence comparison from the theory side that was started by some motivation in genomics as well as some uh, motivation in communication that produced results that can look far from uh, practical or of immediate use. In fact, much of the results have been inspired by the so-called embedding problem. What you'd like to do in the embedding problem is take a bunch of objects, these objects can be strings, and find for each one an uh, object in a better universe, a more treatable universe such as the two-dimensional Euclidean space, right? You'd like, for visualization purposes, we do it all the time. Take these strings, try to find a location, a point in the two-dimensional Euclidean space, such that the distances between objects are roughly preserved. And uh, there's a bulk of literature on trying to do that. And it turns out that you can also embed strings under the block edit distance to uh, the Euclidean space. Not necessarily two-dimensional, 
but uh, larger dimensional. However, um, uh, the embeddings themselves have started the whole discussion uh, on computing blockaded distances approximately. Um, I guess I'm going to skip many of these uh, background results. Uh, basically, the two results from uh, this time motivated me to move into genomics and try to apply what we have uh, from that time. And I started collaborating with my uh, colleague, Evan Eichler, at that, at that point. Uh, I was frustrated by, uh, number one, uh, I wanted to solve the problem. And uh, I didn't care about exactly whether the solution was interesting or not. I wanted to finish off the problem. And although the first few papers were greeted well with the theory community, later I had difficulty in publishing some of them. So I was looking for a venue that would be more welcoming. And uh, bioinformatics was that venue. Um, and uh, the more I got into it, the more I noticed that there are many, many details to be handled. And at that point, we didn't have full individual genome sequences to do any comparison. But I'm glad uh, I got into it because now, slowly, we are getting those uh, individual genome sequences through 1,000 genome sequence uh, uh, pro projects as well as uh, many other sequencing efforts, especially for uh, uh, s uh, specific types of cancers. Now we have a wealth of data. Hopefully, soon enough, we'll be able to provide you specific markers in the form of structural radiations that will help uh, diagnose disease at very early stages. Uh, many people worked on uh, the projects that I've uh, tried to briefly mention. Uh, some of the members of the lab, uh, including Ferdun Hormozdiari and uh, Iman Haji Rasulia and Faraz Haj, have been uh, working on mapping and structural radiation detection angles. Bora is working on the uh, transcriptomic side of it, and same goes with Andrew, two new master's students in the lab. Um, Alex was a uh, postdoctoral fellow who worked on uh, interpretation of alignments. John is an ex-PhD student um, who led the work on uh, copy number variation. Uh, Erai is my ex-master's student. Uh, it's, it's a very important lesson for me, too. He failed uh, the PhD qualifier exam, so he had to leave. This is what we had at Case Western. And I yet recommended him to Evan. And he moved there, and he started the whole discussion on structural variation detection by using paired and sequencing. His uh, paper on the subject is the first, and is very well known and well cited. Graham is an ex-PhD student uh, who, uh, again, started the whole discussion on comparing sequences with block reversals. He's now a pretty well-known database researcher. And I have to also thank uh, my granting agencies. I'm, I'm sure that I'm uh, missing quite a few of them, especially the ones from the US. And uh, thanks to you for listening. Thank you very much, Cenk, you. for your vibrant presentation. I'm glad to see there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> and yeah, uh, we may have uh, time for one or two uh, brief questions. Yeah. Uh, Ted, there is one. Going back, Cenk, to your comment about the difference between theory, working in theory and working in bioinformatics. I mean, I've been reading recently some papers in Symposium of Theory of Computation, yeah. and it's super abstract. And then I happened to look at your recent paper on uh, on the uh, the pi RNA algorithm, and it's very much embedded in this. There's a there's a, a uh, dissolution energy of this for these things. It's yeah. much more grounded in specific things. How does it feel to be switching between these two worlds? The world of ultra abstraction and in the world of 
there's this, there's this genome sequence for this species and it has this number associated with it. And is it the same kind of thinking or do you have to sort of change, it's been change really your tough. mindset? Uh, and I have to say that uh, much of the credit goes to the students. Eventually, they decide on the direction they pick and they become uh, the specific person, the specific tool for the specific problem. So for me, life is relatively easy. I'm not doing the programming myself. <laughs> yes. Um, when, it, when you're working with period end reads, there's sort of a, an ongoing trap, and that's when one of your reads maps into a degenerate repeat sequence. Oh, so yeah. if you've got like a 30 mer or 50 mer that's resident in the genome in tens of thousands of copies, yeah. but it's intrinsically degenerate, 1% level, then it means that your paired end read can match perfectly as a consequence of a error in the paired end sequence. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And, and, that, and causes, that causes a repetitive, recurrent, well-supported, apparent rearrangement. Have you figured out an efficient way to parse those out? I, I haven't yet. It's just no. The answer is no. It's a very good question. Thank you. Do we have um, I, I guess this is one. I, I have to add one thing. I haven't, but I think it's time to go back to the theory. I, I, me or some other more capable person should sit down and try to figure out. We, we have been... Insertions and deletions are relatively easy cases, and we are not covering all cases. We tried to do a classification with some of the students, and boy, was it long. Uh, there's a very nasty case analysis awaiting us. I mean, it, it might lie in the type of machine mistakes that are made. I mean, they may be usable, because the machines don't make random mistakes. They make all yeah. the critical yeah. types of mistakes. That's so, true. Excuse me. Oxymoron. Yeah, it, it's going to be a challenge for the coming, I can easily envision three years. Whether it will be solved or not has to be seen. Thank you. I would like to thank our speaker again.